we have Robert here who's came to MCC and he's graduated from here and he has um, some amazing things about survival to listen to. So let's give him attention. Thank you. Well, um, like I say, graduate of MCC back in 96 through the nursing program. Um, prior to that, I was a combat medic in the U.S. Army uh, in the mid-80s and had some adventures with that up in Alaska and various other places. Um, and um, in nursing career, primarily in behavioral medicine and working for the VA. That's the two prominent areas that I've worked in, and a number of other specialties throughout. But I've also been a wilderness survival instructor for more than two decades. I've worked with a lot of youth groups throughout the state of Michigan. Um, I have taught or practiced wilderness survival um, from as far north as the interior of Alaska all the way down to South America. And um, had a lot of fun doing that. You get to see a lot of different terrain that way. And uh, this earth is a lot of diversity to it, so um, learning how to adapt to each environment is um, a challenge, and it's a, kind of a curiosity as well. So, come on in, folks. Um, this is just a header for one of the courses that I taught a couple of years ago. My daughter, who is a graphic design, she kind of helped put some of this stuff together for me. So, uh, in some of the descriptions, she's like, what is that? So she fills in the blank, and uh, hopefully it's not too uh, much of a um, distraction. But um, probably one of the biggest things in, in wilderness survival is knowing your limits. And so, as we say, do not challenge the forces of nature, because thou art small and biodegradable. Nature will swallow you up, and no one will ever know you're gone unless they are expecting you somewhere. So it's always good to uh, at least have a plan when you go out and let people know approximately where you're going and roughly when you're going to be back. That way, they'll know it's like, hmm, should we look for them or not? That's when you find out if your friends like you. <laughs> it's like, eh, we'll give them a couple extra days. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is just some brief, because this is a, such a short talk. We kind of have to bounce across the surface of the, of the topic of survival, because it, uh, it can be years of study to, to drill into each one of these topics and become um, not just proficient, but a master at, at the, and it's all based on your geography, because what works here in Michigan is not going to be the same as, say, the bayous of Louisiana, or again, the interior of Alaska, um, just weather extremes, and just the, the habitat in general. So. It's always important to kind of learn where you're at, learn the font, the flora, those type of things from the area that you're going to be uh, traveling in and such. This um, first one here, it's in military terms called Oodaloo. And uh, it was um, drafted by a, a colonel from the Air Force, I believe. I forget his name right offhand. But the concept is pretty simple. You know, and fairly straightforward. Observe. You're just observing. Unfortunately, in our world today, we have lost the fine art of observing because most of the time you see people, they're observing is focused like this, and they're walking along, and they're just not observing anything. In the wild, it's important that you know your understanding of where you're at and your orientation at all times. Number one, you don't want to get lost. Number two, you don't want to kind of, again, area you're in here in Michigan is pretty benign. As far as all places in the world, it's pretty benign. We really don't have um, any large predators that routinely eat humans. 
<laughs> you know, we have the proverbial black bears and some mountain lions on occasion. But when's the last time you've heard of anybody in Michigan being attacked by one of those? Doesn't happen. We don't really have poisonous snakes either. You know, the Nessasaki rattlesnake is fairly much a recluse. It's not an aggressive snake, and it's really not going to bite you unless you're trying to handle it or tease it or something. Doing something you shouldn't be doing. You know, um, insects. You know, we don't have malaria with mosquitoes and things of that sort. Um, Lyme's disease, those type of things are definitely an issue we have to watch for and that's why we do some protection as far as tucking our pant legs and things like that when we're going out. But um, all in all, it's pretty benign. You know, we're not going to pick up any really nasty diseases um, by drinking the water. Not that I encourage you to drink the water without treatment of some kind anyways because quite frankly, at least theoretically, there is no surface water left on the planet that you can drink safely without potentially coming into some kind of harm, either through chemical contamination or you know, disease process or something like that, um, like Giardia and things of that, that sort. Um, orient, again, staying oriented. And then with that, knowing what you're seeing, where you're at in relationship to what you're seeing, deciding what you're going to do. And maybe just continue walking down the trail. And uh, of course, acting is just that. You're continuing to do based on the information you're receiving. And then the loop part of it is, I just redo it again. And it's, it's a very simple premise of just being aware of where you're at. Are there things that I need to be aware of? Um, should I in the process of being aware of that, what is my reaction to it? You know, I, I'm walking down the trail, it's starting, the sun's starting to set. I'm aware of that, I'm observing that, I'm oriented to that, and now I need to decide, should I start looking for a place to set up camp and then act onto it? Like, and that acting could be, no, I'm not gonna do it now, I'm gonna walk another 10 minutes up the trail or whatever, look for a better site. But you're constantly doing that so that you're always evaluating your situation and you never lose track of what's happening around you and how should I be reacting to that. Um, having received some pilot training over the years, it's like when you're walking down the trail, look for things. It's like fire starting materials. Not just for a campsite, but um, I'm going to need to go and start a fire when I get to the camp, but rather than look for it once I get there, why not be looking for it on the way? And we'll talk about some of those items here in a bit. But, um, you know, water sources, different things like that. Animal sign, especially if you're in a different part of the country where there are bigger critters out there, especially ones that like to track you and eat you. It's good to know that they're out there. Um, those type of things. So you're constantly looping through and I'll see if I can keep this up and operating. <laughs> there we go. Um, basic acronym, because we live in, a, in an environment that uh, theoretically has four seasons. Uh, this is supposed to be winter. <laughs> It'll be tomorrow. Yeah, it's tomorrow. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's Michigan. Wait five minutes. If you don't like the weather, it'll change. Um, very important, though, if you're in really cold environments like Alaska, um, that cold acronym, you know, keep your, your clothing, your gear clean. If you have to do physical labor, don't do it to such an extent that you start to overheat. Once you start sweating and your clothes start to saturate, eventually you're going to have to slow down your activity and those wet clothes are going to come back to bite you because that cold is going to start setting in. Use of layers. Hence, if you do have to go and um, use a, a fair amount of s exertion, take a few layers off. Maintain that core temperature so that you're not getting too cold or too hot. And then, again, keep it dry. Um, if you're in a, in a snow environment, you don't want your clothing to get saturated from the snow or 
if you're walking through and you get your feet wet. Um, feet wet, wet feet is pretty miserable when it gets really cold. Um, I've had my feet frostbit before and it's not a pleasant experience. Um, again, no bad weather, only bad gear. And that doesn't mean that what you have is, is when I say bad gear, it means inadequate for the situation. If you prepare for worst case scenario, then if it doesn't happen, great. But if it does, you're not going to be miserable and possibly um, physically endangered from it. And um, this is just for if you're going to start doing outdoor activities and you want to go and really streamline what your your gear content for your bags and stuff, which we'll we'll cover in a little bit here. Make a list of all the gear you take out with you. Just just sit down, inventory everything before you go out. And then when you return from your outing, go through that list and say, what didn't I use? And then the next time, don't include that. Because Again, every ounce feels like a pound, and every pound feels like a ton when you're out there for a while, especially once you get tired, and even worse if you're injured. Um, but there are certain things that you don't want to go and exclude necessarily, like a first aid kit. Those are types of things like an insurance policy. You really need to have them, but you hope you never have to use them. But if you do, it's really important that you have it available. And that is kind of a personalized thing. Everybody's first aid kit might be much different. Me as a combat medic, I'm going to probably have a little bit more in-depth items than the average layperson. And as a nurse, I would have more medical knowledge that I would be able to go and utilize some more advanced equipment than, say, a layperson would. Um, but again, there's a lot of great information online on how to go and pack, even down to what they call an IFAC, individual first aid kits, where you personalize that for you, and then uh, everybody in your group should have their own. That way, you know, as a medic um, in the Army, I couldn't carry enough medical equipment on me to go and treat the whole platoon that I was in charge of if everybody got injured. So everybody was responsible for carrying basic first aid items on them, and if that person got wounded, I would use their stuff first on them. And we'd always carry it in a standardized location, so uh, under high stress situations, you wouldn't have to be fumbling around to try to figure out where, where did they put this stuff. It's always in a standardized pouch or, or pocket or something like that. So these are just things to be aware of if you're out and about, if you have a larger group, um, even yourself. Um, when I'm out, I always keep it in such a location. That way, again, under high stress situation, I get injured really bad. I don't have to think, where did I put that? And especially if it's a bleeding situation where you know I'm trying to find a tourniquet and I got a major bleed going on, I don't remember what pouch I put it in. Um, just, just little things like that. Basic kits. Um, again, because this is kind of a short talk, and so I don't have a lot of time to go and cover things in detail, i give you give you some ideas of things that you can pack with you. Um, and again, this is highly personalized. Everybody's going to have different needs and different capabilities as far as how much weight they could carry and such. Um, this is probably the most basic of items you can get by with. And the one, the one thing about survival is the more skill that you have, the less you have to carry. And that is very beneficial in some ways, but there's also a trade-off. The less you carry, the probably the less comfort you're going to have. You know, uh, I have friends in my circle that they are survival, what I call purists. You know, it's like, I like to go and hedge my bets by having a little bit of gear with me. Some of it is technical stuff, some of it is just primitive. But they like to do this, well, I'm going to go and 
make all my fires from primitive materials and use anything but a match and all this and build my own shelters and make even down to creating my own knives from flint and those type of things and using napping techniques and it's like hey that's perfect you know it's nice to know that that is a perishable skill that if you don't stay current with it all the time you're going to lose the edge on that where having some equipment with you gives you a little bit more assurance and insurance that um, I can fall back on them if I need to. Um, this little setup here, the machete kit, which I have here with me, um, they, I got the idea from Dave Canterbury. He's a, a fairly well-known uh, survival instructor down in southeast Ohio. Probably one of the best schools in the country right now if anybody wanted to go and take um, anything from basic to advanced wilderness survival. He's, he's quite the guy. But um, just a basic machete. Well, that, this was a basic machete. Um, started out as a U.S. Ontario, which I highly modified. And I have done that on pretty much all of my gear. And I encourage you guys to do it too. You get into it, get creative. Modify your gear. If you got something that like, I think I could make that better or more suitable to my needs, then do so. And um, the, uh, obviously it's a big knife, big tool. As they say, big knives can do things that little knives can't, but not vice versa. So if you got a big knife, learn how to use it. There's a lot of different surface areas on a larger knife that one can use. And of course, modify this for various reasons. The, this sweet spot in here is considered more of the chopping surface. If you're chopping for clearing a pathway, making shelter materials, um, even procuring firewood, things like that. Uh, the tip of the blade, generally you want that to be a much more uh, pointed and sharp if you're needing it to skin an animal per se. Um, this area in here is more of a, a workhorse area that I put a, a much uh, steeper grind onto it so I can use it as a draw shave if I'm using some kind of camp craft and I'm making camp tools or things of that sort. Um, the back side of it, I put a, a sharp right angle um, cut onto it. Again, for scraping, sometimes you want to scrape the bark off from a branch or something that you're making whatever or you're you're doing a more refined type of surfacing for like if you're making spoons or cookware things of that sort also uh, for fire starting using a ferrocium rod that sharp angle gives me something that I can go and scrape that ferrocium rod to go and produce that spark without damaging my cutting surfaces and so there's a, a lot that goes into um, these types of applications. And then the, the sheath itself, essentially this is a standalone survival kit. The, um, and sometimes, I mean this pretty much travels with me most anywhere I go. <laughs> Except when I fly. For some reason today they don't put you on a plane with a machete. I guess it's just these people get nervous or something. Um, anyways, using a hard platform for a sheath, then you can go and actually mount a lot of items onto it as opposed to using a canvas sheath like a lot of them come with. Um, this is just a inch and a quarter black water pipe that you heat up and press down and flat and then work it till you get the blade to fit in there nicely. But onto it, um, these ranger bands, which are just a um, old inner tube. They can be very handy because you can cut them to, to whatever thickness you need and go from there. Pretty much has all the elements necessary for basic survival into it. I have a bottle of iodine that I have on here in a dropper form that I can use not only for first aid uh, applications or for water purification. Underneath this uh, 55 gallon construction 
garbage bag, which can be used for a shelter or a poncho or collection item as well. There is a one gallon Ziploc uh, freezer bag so that I can collect water into it and then purify it as I need to. Um, Phariseum rod in there again for starting fires. Fire starting in this environment is probably one of the number one beneficial skills that you can develop. Procuring and purifying water would be number two because we can't live very long without water. The rule of threes that they use, you know, three minutes without air, three days without water, or three days on water, and 30 days on food, um, sounds nice, but in real world terms, try going three days without water. After day one, you're gonna be kind of non-functional, and that's gonna dramatically affect your ability to survive. And so, like they say, don't ration your water, drink it to stay hydrated. Because it only requires a 3% loss in hydration from your normal body hydration status before it starts to affect, number one, your brain. And it, it starts affecting your ability to think clearly. And um, with that, things start to spiral downhill from there, especially when you're in a, again, high stress situation. You don't know if you're gonna make it or not because you don't know what's, what you're facing because of whatever scenario that got you into the situation to begin with. So anyways, <clears throat> then this also has a battle dressing in here that um, can be used for large wounds and things like that. Pretty much everything that I try to carry always has a dual application. That means I can use it for more than one thing, just like this battle dressing. Oh, it's first aid. But I could also use it because it's in a sealed container in a harsh environment where it's wet. I can go and open that up and use that for a fire starter if I needed to because it's dry inside that. Um, so try to, as you, as you continue to work on your survival skills, you'll learn to refine that if I'm going to carry something, it's going to have more than one application to it. And in some cases, it's even nice if I have other items that can back up. Because the, the saying is two is one, one is none. Um, a lot of times that's referred to like your primary knife. Uh, that is probably the primary uh, tool that used in survival. But if you're not taking care of it or you happen to break it or lose it and you don't have a backup, then you're in deep doo-doo. So, um, Good to take care of your gear. Now, let me see if I can get back online here. Any questions about this at all? And feel free to go on and ask a question. When you go hiking and camping, <coughs> excuse me, do you bring trauma kit with you or do you typically just bring like a, you know, standard of the mill first aid kit? I tend to go and just carry an IFAC, which is the individual one, but okay. the trauma kit stays in the vehicle. Gotcha. And that way, um, you know, if we have somebody um, in the group that has a problem, we're generally going to be sending somebody out for help uh, if we're not in a place where we can go and, you know, have cell phone coverage or something like that. That person goes out, makes contact for help, and can bring the trauma kit back. And then if need be, go out to meet the whatever rescue party may be. That, gotcha. that type of thing. So, kind of a general rule because a lot of yeah. factors involved, especially around a multi-day trip where you're way out, that becomes a little problematic. But right. carrying gear is huge. Um, and, a, and a trauma kit like that in the event that something might happen. Um, partly why I also teach wilderness medicine where you can improvise things in the wild to uh, help support in the absence of a trauma kit. Okay. So, good question. Now. Okay, let's see. Now this is clearly a much more advanced kit. Uh, today the common terms are bug out bags and things like that. This is going to increase a person's comfort level significantly because now you have the ability to go and 
Um, you don't have to improvise a shelter. You can actually go and use a poncho, or in some cases, I'll carry two ponchos to go and build build a shelter with, and um, still wear one perhaps while it's uh, the weather's bad. Um, the um, space blankets, which are very handy to have. You can go and quickly put these up and um, use the reflector side to go and reflect heat back around you so that you're not having to stand there in a rotisserie and fires over here and I'm trying to keep everything warm. <laughs> It'd be kind of a challenge after that. But the, the, the cool thing about this is um, a lot of us have developed different techniques now where you can go and set up a quick lean-to with a reflector blanket like this. And if you get the, just some cheap drop plastic for painting, you can pick them up for under $4, um, usually about 12 feet long, 9 feet wide, something of like that. You can actually put that over top of your shelter and drape it properly and just have the plastic down in front so it kind of creates a tent over top of your lean-to and if you position your fire at the right distance not too close because you don't want to mount your plastic but not so far away you can actually go and heat that shelter up to 80 degrees in the middle of the winter time and if you're caught out without a sleeping bag that could, just might save your life and it can be quite comfortable Again, you have to go and do a lot of fire management because most fires don't go more than a couple hours without needing some tending to, but that couple of hours could be critical to give you a chance to go and rest um, and recover some of your, your strength. So um, again, I just encourage you to go online and explore some of these because there's a lot of neat stuff out there uh, where we're at today. Again, this slide was built for a, a different class that I had, and um, I do some personal security work too, so sometimes I'll, I'll teach uh, um, a little bit on the security end and as far as everyday carry type things. And uh, that uh, has a, a whole topic of its own. On to the fire making. It seems really simple. Most of us think making a fire is pretty easy. When I was um, doing an inland waterways course in Alaska, we actually spent 10 days on the Yukon River um, in open river boats. And that was uh, quite the adventure. It's hard to imagine a river that that big when you're on just a little open river boat, you know, at one stretch of the river, it was big enough that we had two foot waves. And that wasn't because of rapids. It was just, it was so big, the wind was blowing waves that across um, the, there's a portion of the Yukon in the interior, just below the Arctic Circle, what they call the Crazy Horse Slough. And we were, there's, um, three of us medics that were tasked out with a group of engineers and they were learning how to navigate the inland waterways of Alaska. We were this there to go and provide medical coverage, but we also got the benefit of the training as well. So we we're all riding along and um, we we're just navigating using compasses and charts, just old maps. Of course, these maps say right on it. Um, these have never been authenticated for accuracy. That's really comforting. <laughs> And we were supposed to operate um, in teams of two. There were seven boats total, uh, six training boats and one maintenance boat. And uh, our first day out, we, um, we got in the water, we went north um, into the Arctic Circle as the Yukon f was flowing north. And then we um, bivouacked on a, a sandbar. And it's like, I have pictures of it was 11.30 at night and the sun was still up. So <laughs> it's like, that's kind of an interesting experience. But the next day, we all hopped in. And of course, you know, military protocol, you're supposed to keep line of sight at all times. and absolutely radio contact. And so 
our boat was the lead boat, and we had a pretty strong engine at the time, and so we were zipping right along, and, and um, come around lunchtime, we pulled into a, an area, and our buddy boat was with us, and we stopped and had lunch and everything like that, and time to load up. They loaded up, and they took off, boom. It's like, like that's not protocol. They need to be hanging out a little bit. And sure enough, we all got in the boat, and our engine wouldn't start, flooded out onto us. And so Cadre, they had to go and pull the cowl off and was fiddling around with it, and this civilian boat was zipping by. It's like, well, oh, there are other human beings out here. That's nice. <laughs> we finally got the boat started and took off down river, and it's like, now, mind you, the river is a mile wide at this point. So that's like some big water. And they were so far down river at that point that we could only see a speck on the horizon. I actually saw two specks, our buddy boat and the civilian boat. And lo and behold, we're going into the Crazy Horse Slough. There were, at that point, two channels, and each boat took a different channel. Hmm. Radio. Battery's dead. No backup battery. Okay. So, we thought, well, surely they wouldn't lose sight of us because they know that the protocol is. And, uh, but we got down there and nobody around. And we thought, well, this looks like the main channel. But... They're not waiting, so we'll take this channel over here, because surely they're just... We went 15 minutes down that channel and realized, nope, not them. We came around and went back up and down the other channel, ran for two hours, and we finally found the civilian boat docked at a little cabin. And at that point, we knew we were kind of in trouble, because we were the last boat. All the others were ahead of us. And we had turned over all of our charts to the buddy boat who was supposed to lead at that time. So all we had was a compass. And at that point, going into the Crazy Horse Slough, from one official bank to the other, which was a little over a mile wide where we had lunch, went into 40 miles of just a mass of different channels. It's just the low ground of Alaska. So we ended up being just navigating strictly by compass. And we had a fuel point that we had to meet, otherwise we'd be dead in the water. And um, so we just like cranked it up, thinking maybe we'll catch up with somebody. And uh, then it started to storm, and it started to rain, and it started to pour. And it rained so hard that we had to take the drain plug out of the boat to drain the water while we're running because we're taking on that much water. And then it started to thunder and lightning. And it's like, hmm. We could pull over and do the safe thing, or we could try to go and push it and just see if we could catch up with the main body, which is what we ultimately decided to do. And it was, I mean, just pouring and raining so hard, it was uh, like, this could be kind of dicey here, because we still don't know where our fuel point is, and we're still in the midst, so we just kept following the main channels and the cadre on our boat was just using this compass to guide. Turns out we come up on this village three or four hours later and it's like, not sure, looks like it may be, but at that time in Alaska there was a number of, uh, of uh, settlements that were considered dry settlements. A lot of bootlegging going on there and a couple months prior to us going out on this operation, they, there was a settlement on our route that um, they sent two federal agents in to investigate, and they never came back. And so they sent four armed agents into that settlement. And they found them about a week later on a makeshift raft floating down the river with nothing but the clothes on their back. And so it's like, these folks don't always know the difference between military and federal agents, and we weren't armed anyways, so we were just like, is this it or not? <laughs> so fortunately it was. Everybody else had taken different channels and 
pulled off for the storm, and we just kept plowing through, and we just got lucky. But uh, that was one of the crazy adventures. Uh, but what I was starting to say is this cadre, you know, his idea of making a fire was we pulled over on a, on a sandbar, and there was driftwood as high as the ceiling, and as long as the room that would just caught up there during the flow, and he just pulled out a bunch of it and got a can of gas and dumped onto it. Boom. That was his way of making a fire. <laughs> it's like, well, we don't carry five gallons of gas with us wherever we go, so, um, and we prefer not to go and start forest fires. But, um, so we refine our techniques for building fires. And uh, let's see, one of the easiest ways and simplest, cost effective to carry is just get some cotton balls. Plain old cotton balls and um, a small container of Vaseline. And you can start a fire by various different means easy enough. You just swab that cotton ball through the Vaseline and then fluff it out a little bit so that, that the cotton fibers can still either catch a spark or light whatever. But that cotton ball will burn, depending on how much Vaseline you have onto it, anywhere from five to eight minutes. And it produces a lot more heat because of the Vaseline. So if your tinder is damp, it will warm it up, dry it out, and allow you to catch, it to catch fire. Um, very easy method to have. And you can go and pack cotton balls into a, a little film container or any number of ways that condense it down and just pull out what you need and different things like that. The uh, a natural alternative, which there are many, but my favorite is the use of birch bark. The, it's a good uh, way to make a torch if you're lost. There are a lot of things that you can do with birch bark. Yeah, I have a friend who was, he grew up in the Upper Peninsula and he was in the 5th Special Forces, and he taught me a lot of interesting things about birch bark that I didn't know. But not only will it burn when it's wet, because it has its own natural resins into it, and you can go and tease it out to get it where you could even catch a spark if you're good, and it will self-ignite, or you could go and use the method of the cotton balls and add birch bark to it, which will dramatically increase how the, the flame builds up and um, add to your fire as, as it goes along. Um, one thing he taught me is you could take birch bark like this and put it into a container and just put it in the fire and this birch bark will actually melt down into a liquid state. And you can mix that with the ash from the fire to make like an epoxy. And it's a, a natural adhesive, adhe ooh, glue, we'll put it that way. <laughs> um, the Native Americans used it for, for putting their birch bark canoes together. And it's amazingly strong and very durable. And if, you, if it cools down, you use it when it's warm, but when it cools down, you can just reheat it to liquefy it enough and reapply it. So a lot of cool things. The reason I brought this along is to, this is how I make char cloth when you're using the, um, the um, flint and steel method of striker, which is, has been used for thousands of years. At one point, I had became proficient in starting a fire using seven different methodologies, none of which required a match or a lighter. And so um, this is, again, just the basic concept. The um, char cloth, which is essentially just that, you can take um, any type of 100% cotton, in this case, I just use old jeans, cut them into squares, and then put them into this container, and then just put it in the fire. 
All it is is just an old juice can, I think, that um, cut down. I'm trying not to make too much of a mess here. Oops. But, um, and then crimp the edges of it. You can put chunks of wood, preferably a hardwood, and that ultimately cooks down into a, a charcoal, which you can go and grind that up for activated charcoal for medicinal uses, fire starting uses, all kinds of things of that sort. But the, um, there's a little pinhole right in the top. And what you do is when you put it in the fire, as it starts cooking off the impurities, you'll notice smoke will come out of that hole. And it's usually a bluish type of smoke. You know it's getting down to where it's almost done when the smoke turns white. And then when it stops smoking all together, all the impurities that burn off, you just remove it from the fire, set it aside, and let it cool down. But the, um, the char cloth, fairly durable in some ways, but it's still quite fragile. But the idea is you put it on your stone right on the top of it. And then it's a, it's a very kind of a precise technique. Use the elbow as the fulcrum point, and you just strike it down to where you, I'm not going to go and do it in here because <laughs> I don't want to create too much of a mess or anything like that. But the striking, the steel going across the, the flint, because the flint is a certain hardness, will strike a spark off from the metal. And when you capture it, you do it enough, it'll capture onto the char cloth and it'll start to glow red. And it'll hold that until it burns all the way through the, the char cloth. And you can use that to, um, it, it basically buys you time. So I'll pass that around if you want to go and feel just how lightweight it is and everything. But in that, for those of you who may be interested in practicing that, this concept, um, you can just go to a hardware store or any place, big box store, and just get some jute corn. Just plain old jute corn. It has to be jute, can't be the sisal because of the different types of fibers. But um, you just break it apart down to the individual strands and then fluff it out. To, you basically create a nest, like um, what do you call a bird's nest or a mouse nest, and work it around. And that char cloth, while it's still glowing, you put it inside and fold it over on itself. Then there's that certain finesse, you can't squeeze it to go and crush it out, but it has to be able to blow air through it. And you can, and it'll, as you will notice, when you blow on the char cloth, the ember lights up more, producing more heat, and ultimately you'll get this to burst into flame. And it's like I teach folks: don't, don't, don't do this. You know, you probably lose your eyebrows. <laughs> and the first doing it, you know, it's like get get dramatic, and you know, it's like pray to the gods, whatever, you know blow up into the air so when it bursts into flames, the flames go up. And then he's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> and then you go and take it and put it into your pre-built fire. Fire building is all about preparation. Uh, the last thing you want to do is go through all this effort, get a flame, and they say, well, now where, where's my wood, where's my building material, or my fire material? So it's all about preparation. You get your, you know, this is the uh, tinder part of it. They, and then you get the kindling, the fine shavings and everything. And then working your way up from pencil size to finger size, to, you know, to thumb size. And, and um, there, there's a whole bunch of different fire building techniques on how to go and structure it ahead of time. But um, I, just for simplicity's sake, tend to use just a, a lay a log down and preferably the direction of wind flow and then I'll go and put my fire material up and then I can go and once this is lit, tuck it underneath there and then just baby it. 
just nurture it until it gets to the point where it's self-sustaining. Usually when the wood is the size of your finger that is burning freely, when it gets to that size and as they say, when the flame is as big as your hand coming off in your wood, then you know the fire is largely self-sustaining and you could turn away from it and go get other things. Um, so anyways, any questions on that? Yes. So for the char cloth, you just throw it in uh, tin and then you put it in the fire and that's it? Once the, once the smoke dwindles down to, right. like I said, the white, yep, just pull it out, let it cool, and then I put it into a, another container. Um, there's uh, Altoid tins are, are great. This is just one of my little fire kits that can go under the pocket. Again, it's got the Ranger bands, and this I can actually make fire cloth in this little container itself. So um, you can get really creative and concise with it all, and I encourage you, experiment. You know, you get some basic principles principles down and then you can experiment. I mean, this is the way our forefathers lived. This wasn't uh, a hobby for them. This was how they, this is how you came to be because these people knew what they were doing. <laughs> if they didn't, we wouldn't be here to talk about it because they wouldn't have survived it, obviously. But, um, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll thumb through here a couple different styles just so you have a level of awareness. This is called the fire piston. And um, it basically operates on compressed air. You take a piece of the char cloth, or in this case I would make some char cord using cotton rope, and put a piece of it right in the tip there, and then just gently put it in there, and then you strike it a couple of times really hard and it creates enough compression that it generates the heat to actually ignite that piece of char cord. Now granted that's a very small piece so when it does finally ignite you have less time to work with as far as getting it into your bird nest and, and working that way. But it's um, been a very effective technique over the years. Some of the more modern ones um, just using reflective um, dish. Believe it or not, back in the 70s, this was a real cool trend. You know, people use these for lighting cigarettes. <laughs> but we can adapt it. And, uh, you know, you put your cigarette in the air and there, and then on a day like today, you line it up with the sun and it would ignite it. Um, for our purposes, we would use a piece of, this is chaga. It's a fungus that grows pretty much on the white paper birch ultimately kills the tree but this is an amazing has amazing properties to it it will burn like incense if you put a chunk of it in here and got it to ignite it would do the same thing as the char cloth allowing you to time to go and pull the fire or blow it into uh, into existence this actually has some amazing cancer properties anti-cancer properties to it and uh, at one point they were <clears throat> charging many dollars an ounce just for that. But um, again, just giving a smattering of different ideas just so you uh, have some idea of the range of things. And I know we're running short on time and I could talk for hours and try to get this back up. And I'm going to move on to water purification and filtration. There is a huge difference between the two because filtration will take out particulate matter. It will also take out uh, pathogens to a certain size, but it doesn't take out contaminants. You know, we live in the heartland of Michigan, farm ground. They have things like glyphosate and stuff that's in the runoff. Um, again, water source. I have my choice of picking a stream or a spring that comes directly out of the ground versus a drainage ditch. I would go with the spring every time. That does not guarantee that that spring doesn't also have glyphosate into it or other pesticides and herbicides. It just means it's taken longer for them to filtrate down through into the aquifer to get to it. 
So it's going to have less contaminants to it. These Sawyer filters, probably one of the cheapest and most effective for filtration. It actually uses dialysis type technology, much like our own kidneys, to filter um, the different particulates and um, pathogens of the water. Again, it doesn't take out um, certain types of heavy metals, uh, pesticides and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. So you have to be aware of that. But the, the Sawyers, I mean, this little setup here is about 30 bucks. But this little thing will go on, it's advertised that it will filter up to, to 100,000 gallons of water at least. It has a little syringe to it that you can, when it starts, flow starts to slow down, you can back flush it to go and get it back to its original flow rate. And you can go and either fill these bags up with dirty water, screw the filter onto it, and squeeze it directly into your mouth. There's a whole bunch of different ways of using it. Very versatile and cost effective. The thing that you have to be aware of is that you can't let these freeze. Again, this is about being aware of your environment. Because if it freezes, the microtubules in there can be compromised and you don't know for sure whether you're if, whether it's allowing contaminated water through the system. So these are just things to be aware of. Um, this little device here is actually a myox type device that uses salt and brine and mixing it down. The in the original website these were developed for military applications and uh, it said that they would it would purify even contaminants. Not does it just kill pathogens, but it purifies um, different chemicals, even to what they they call VX. VX is well, unless you're in the military, wouldn't really know what that is. It is probably one of the most toxic substances on the planet. It is a neurological agent that the, the Soviets had developed. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a perspective, if you were taking a piece of plate glass and polished it nice and clean and put a drop of water and then blew onto it, you know those little micro drops that spin off from it? One of those little micro drops on your skin would be enough to kill you. That's how nasty it is. But these type of things can actually neutralize those things. Not going to test it, but <laughs> just for information purposes only. Um, but again, big difference between purifying water and filtering water. And it's also helpful to strain your water beforehand because that will go and preserve the life of your filters significantly. This is just a military shamar that um, very useful for not only keeping, your, keeping you warm and cold, um, wrapping yourself during dust storms, which is what they used for in, in the Middle East, but you can use it for straining water or just laying it out and using it as a collection cloth for wild edibles and things of that source. So never underestimate just a simple cloth because they can be used for so many different things. Um, let's see, what else? The old-fashioned standard of boiling water. Um, can't encourage you enough if you're going to go out, you know, the modern water bottles are great, but you should have a metal one and it shouldn't be double walled. Back when I started out, they only had these single walled ones and I thought, okay, well, it works great, but then the double walled ones come on, keeps your drinks cooler, longer, warmer, longer, all that great stuff. But for wilderness applications, you can only carry it for water or drink. A single wall one, you can actually use for cooking, boiling water in, all these different things. The double wall ones, you put it into a fire and it'll explode on you. So just be aware of that. The Nalgene bottles, uh, which this is um, single walled, you can cook into it, hence why I put a high temperature black paint onto it so it absorbs the heat better. But um, 
somewhere in my pile here I have the, um, oh, here it is, the MSR filter, which was one of my favorites. The nice thing about it, it they integrate where you could screw it right onto the bottle. Uh, if you've ever been out in the wild, clumsily, after dark, swatting mosquitoes, trying to hold your water bottle up and pump at the same time, it's kind of annoying. But in this case, they, you can mount it right to it, so all you have to do is focus on pumping the, uh, the filter. And it takes about a minute's worth of pumping of one of these to go and get about a quart of water. So, um, very, very useful because you can cook out of it, you can carry water into it. Um, in the off time, if you're trying to streamline, you can go and store additional gear into here. Put a Ziploc bag into it, you can take the contents out, put it in the Ziploc bag, and now you have something to, to do other applications with. So a lot of, a lot of different um, functions that a water bottle can, just a, a metal water bottle can do for you, as opposed to plastic ones. Um, running out of time, okay. but um, I was going to go and see if I could pull up the um, some of the resources that I had just for. Okay, I can type in. Anybody that needs to go to class, you guys can. Um, anybody that wants to stay a little bit longer and see this, you can is more than welcome to. And uh, since I'm still up here, I haven't been kicked off stage yet. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to be expensive. Doing wilderness survival doesn't have to be expensive. This little stove that I've carried years, just made out of pop cans. It's, just, it's called a little penny stove. You can go online and you can go and find endless ways of building these. And all it is uses is um, methopropyl alcohol, which is basically dry gas that you would get at a gas station. So, you know, if you're driving to your location, you stop at a gas station, and most all of them will have that type of alcohol. And um, the uh, I'll show you just the little setup real quickly. It's just a little screw in the top, put about a tablespoon, maybe two, of alcohol into it, put the screw back onto it. I put it in this little preheater, and then I made this, this little standoff just for my cooking pot or cup. It sets over top of it, and uh, I'll dump a little alcohol into it, into the container, and light that up. It preheats it starts to gasify the alcohol and then the little holes around there forces the the fuel and the flame out and it's just like cooking on a gas stove. It'll run for about seven to eight minutes, enough generally to go and boil some water, cook a meal, and you just put it on there. And it's extremely lightweight and it's easy to replicate. You could go and build one of those and you know, if you have the materials in maybe a half hour at home. So if you lose it, no big loss. And you can make, make them almost in the field practically. If you have a um, needle and some tin to cut them out with. The original penny stove concept was they just had the hole to fill it in the center. And then once you put the fuel into it, you drop a penny onto it to go and seal that hole. That's where the name comes from. I, I went high tech and put a, put a screw in there, you know, so anyways, um, let me scroll through here, boom, one of my little adventures up north. This is a, one of my favorite quotes. Human beings should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, crown a ship, design a building, write a senate balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. So, 
don't be a specialist. <laughs> Diversify. The more adaptable you are to your environment, the more fun you'll have, number one, and the more likely you are to go and get through any situation. Because when you put the diversity of experience, then your creative juices will allow you to go and look at a problem and be able to solve it more efficiently. So, and this is just um, Dave Canberry, great guy, probably one of the number one survival schools here in the U.S. at this time. And these are just some of the various books that um, are part of my survival library, some of my favorites. And um, um, if you don't have a lot of books on the topic and you want to go and find some of these, very diverse as far as their vantage point and how they teach and how they um, um, explain things. The um, Linda Runyon's book, which is an, an amazing book as far as wild edibles, but it's one of the few that actually gives a breakdown on each wild edible and what its nutritional content is. U.S. military actually uses this book to go and teach in their survival schools. Tom Brown, I don't know if I had him down there because I couldn't find the ISB number for this book, but Tom Brown has a also a survival school. He has a number of different books. I kind of cut my teeth on this years ago, as you can see by the how war the book is. Um, very much an expert in the field as well. He focuses more into the natural uh, aspect of it. He was trained by a Native American chief that kind of took him under his wing and um, a lot of great information. So, um, if you have any other questions, I'm more than happy to stick around for a little bit and, and chat while I'm packing things up. Uh, but thank you all for your time. Thank you.